Hi, it's Mike again with Ugetastic. Today I'm sitting down with Giles Bokit. Uh, you might know him on Twitter as Giles Goat Boy. He's been around uh, in the Ruby community pretty much since, well, since there's been a Ruby community. He's a really active uh, FOSS developer. He's done, um, written the book um, Rails as She's Spoken and uh, recently written a very interesting blog post about respect in the community, about uh, having a sense of decorum in our, in our communications with each other. Uh, Thanks, Giles, for, for taking the time to sit down. I really appreciate it. Sure, sure. Glad so, to be here. So what, what inspired that post? And what was, what was the post about, again, just for those who haven't read it? Uh, I think, I, I don't actually recall the exact title, but it was like a simple protocol to enforce or enable uh, you are not your code, mm -hmm. right? Which was that, that blog post that went around a little while, and it was a little unnecessarily controversial because of the context in which it was introduced even though the the essential idea of the blog post was i, I think very valid and that you know oh sorry go ahead that was say the, the for those that don't know that you are not your code was about some people had severely criticized code uh, there was you know rvm versus rbn and then there were some comments about a person who had contributed some some I guess yeah, yeah. Code and... well, let, I'll, I'll, I want to give the backstory then. Um, so the backstory was that uh, RVM was like the, you know, probably still is the dominant uh, Ruby version manager, which is what it stands for. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Sam Stevenson, I think, somebody created a version called, uh, well, created a variant, a similar thing that worked differently mm -hmm. called RVM and uh, introduced it with some snark in the readme, uh, which they then removed after there was sort of like a Twitter drama about it. Uh, and then, you know, You Are Not Your Code came uh, as a blog post from Sam Stevenson maybe like two days after he tweeted that, um, you know, he, he found it very frustrating that every time he talked about the differences between RVM and RBM, uh, people started talking about how they felt that Wayne Seguin, who created RVM, was a good guy, right. and they liked him, and they didn't want to be mean to him. And, you know, he, he wrote this big blog post about, you know, you are not your code. If I criticize your code, it doesn't mean I hate you. It just means I, wa I, I think this code should be different. And it was a totally valid point, but in context, it, it kind of just didn't... Um, it didn't quite work because when I read that, I, I didn't feel like, oh, wow, you know, he's saying this because he wants everyone to be more, you know, nice. It, it felt like he was just sort of evading the consequences of, I mean, right. if, you, if you tell everybody my project exists because that other guy's project sucks, yeah. you know, it, it, it's just not. It, it, it's, it's hard sort to, of, It's hard to spin that as you're, you know, like. Yeah, it's, it's hard to have a conversation at that point, you know? So, what I said, you know, in my blog post was like, you know, if he had just, you know, said like, I'm sorry, I was a dick about that guy's project, but it happened a year ago, and I still believe that my project has some valid technical uh, benefits, right. and I want to just put that part behind, you know, so I'm going to like re-apologize. I don't know if he ever apologized in the first place, but hopefully, and just re-apologize to permanent, permanently clear the air. You know that might be more productive, and uh, during during the course of this post, I referred to Mr. Stevenson as Mr. Stevenson mm -hmm. uh, because you know, and I elaborated later in the post that I I don't know him personally. Right. I don't want to write a blog post about like you know the reason this is a problem is because this guy Sam is a big douchebag. Right. You know because that's not going to solve anything. Mm -hmm. it's right. Just, it's just more of the same. Yeah, it's just more of the same. And I'm like, why not, uh, you know, say, like, if you're going to criticize somebody's behavior online, uh, do them, you know, some, some sort of uh, default respect showing right. by referring to them as, you know, Mr. Stevenson, or if it was an argument with someone else, you know, Ms. Someone else, right? And that way, you know, it really is like a communications protocol, 
and it's been around since the dawn of time. Right. You know, as I mean, not really, but you know, for several well, hundred years at least. It makes me think of martial arts. Um, how the, the goal of martial uh, arts is to get into a ring and beat the hell out of each other, but right, but you start off like you right, know, you respect that you're going to fight, and then there's certain you know you don't do this, you don't do that. Um, I mean, I think even in the MMA, they they have certain things that are kind of you know do that because that's yeah that's yeah poor decorum. Um, you know that. It's a reminder that yeah we are sometimes we're in competition. My you know our, our our ideas are something that we create and we want to put out there. And sometimes we don't like an idea and we would like our idea to be adopted. You know I'm sure uh, Mr. Stevens uh, wanted his idea to be adopted and taken on as the the, the primary goal. Just, the, the way yeah. Like, uh, sorry, just uh, it, it's actually Stevenson, Mr. Stevenson. Stevenson. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but and, you know. and he has, by the way, just you know, to say, like another reason I want to, you know, make sure that if I disagree with him, I still show respect, is because he, I think he wrote Prototype, uh, right. if I recall correctly, which you know, very, very influential. He's been and, no slouch. Yeah, no slouch, and and Pow as well, I think. But yeah, sorry, you were saying. You were saying. But, uh, I was just saying that that. Uh, uh, well, I was talking about the, the martial arts uh, analogy, uh, but. And, and going back to what you're saying about um, uh, when somebody says you are not your code, a lot of it isn't the, the, the delivery and the demeanor of, of the person saying it. I think about, I interviewed uh, Leon Gersing, and um, when he says you're not your code, it's very, man, it's okay. <laughs> you're not your code. It's Don't worry yeah, about it. That's yeah. what you were at that time when you wrote it, and it's great. You know, let's, let's just, you know, it's kind of... Um, very the dude esque. It's kind of Lebowski esque. Uh, but um, uh, and I also think about another person who's contributed, uh, uh, um, Andy Lester, who created ACK and some other tools, uh, mostly in the Perl community. Uh, he he he. Um, ACK is awesome. I yeah, love and ACK ACK was better than Grep. So I mean, a little bit of like a little bit of tease, a little bit of a jab, all delivered in a very um, uh, congenial. Uh, jovial way and when somebody came to me when I interviewed him he was talking about uh, a person was creating a tool called better than ACK and they worried that he would be offended and he's like no no that's you know it, right it's, it's a worthy goal yeah, yeah. It, it's good be better <laughs> but you know that it was delivered with in a way that could still be interpreted as as humorous, but I think yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb here and I'm gonna say sometimes certain people and and it tends to be in the Rails community uh, that I've I've noticed have a little bit of an acerbic way of of delivering. <laughs> I'm trying to say it in the nicest way possible that they can be a little bit caustic in, in, in their opinions. Yeah, there is there is a lot of that, and uh, you know it it doesn't really take very much of it to get a whole atmosphere started. Mm -hmm. And once you have that atmosphere, uh, it kind of seems like, you know, you've got, well, it just, it, it, it takes the fun out of things, right? Like that, that um, I don't know if it's anger or, you know, uh, just just like a really harsh approach to time management or something. But when you when you see that stuff, you know, sooner or later you're going to have to call somebody on it, mm -hmm. and you know it might not be fun to do. It, like in a in an ideal world, it would all just be humor. Uh, you know, but people don't like being made. You know, if someone has a serious mentality, mm -hmm. people don't like being made fun of. Right. Right. And like when, you know, like when that that acerbic vibe is introduced, you know, you might be able to diffuse the effects. Like, you know, I'll, I, I don't want to dance around the issue. One of the um, major sources of um, intense speech in the Rails community is uh, the creator of Rails, David Heinemeier Hansen. And, you know, if you want to criticize Mr. Heinemeier Hansen, uh, there is the somewhat um, obvious challenge that he is an amazing programmer and you know I mean I personally my life was changed for the better by using his software 
mm-hmm. you know, by, by a staggering degree. And I've learned a, a great deal from, you know, from watching what he did and, mm-hmm. and looking at his code and so on and so forth. Um, and I, I really feel that there has to be some way to prevent, like, a, you know, you, you've got in Ruby in general, you've got this notion of Matt's is nice, so we are nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you can't have that as like a guiding thing, then maybe making sure to to demonstrate respect for someone who you disagree with can kind of settle things down in another way. Mm-hmm. You know, like humor is a really good way of diffusing tension. Like I I made fun of uh, Mr. Hanamar Hansen. Uh, with a dramatic reading of Rails is Omakase, which is a blog post he wrote. And I was like, you know, this will probably not do great things for my relationship with that particular <laughs> individual. I, I doubt my respect for him in general is going to be readily apparent in my, you know, because the reading is, uh, I, I exaggerated it and, and made it funny, I hope, right? And, and certainly some people found it funny, which is what you hope for. Uh, and in, in so doing, I, you know, I I wouldn't necessarily say that I was hugely strategic about it, but I did kind of hope that to some degree, like by by put by making it funny, by making the Rails of Omakase thing mm-hmm. funny, hopefully that could act as like a, a what do they call it? like a fire break when you have like uh, all the all the area around a fire raised. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, so and nothing can burn in that area. Yeah, to prevent to prevent the sort of uh, the acerbic fury from spreading, you know, and like creating a whole toxic atmosphere. Was it a little you bit know? of make fun of myself before anybody else can make fun of me for me? Um, you know, you, you you by by removing those huh. those uh, that um, layer of of self seriousness and self. Um, Self- yeah, yeah, by creating an atmosphere of fun. Yeah, and it te- it tears it down so that way it nobody is has to feel like they're approaching you. It just you expose yourself and and you put yourself out there and you, you've you've made fun of yourself and you've exposed a weakness. Therefore, you've made yourself a little bit more human, a little bit more vulnerable. Where some people, I think, still want to have that that wall between them uh-huh. and the world for whatever reason. Yeah, and and well. I worry about that a little because this whole idea of like you know Mister this and, and Ms. that actually feels like a little bit of a wall. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. I mean, well, it's, it's it's the bowing. It's the it's the it's not within the martial arts. It's a sign of respect. You're not bowing. Um, I mean, you bow to the, you know, the instructor out of deference, but to each other, to your peers, you bow not to that individual. Um, but to the environment that you're in, and yeah, if you're respecting yeah. that you're in this environment and you're in this mode of thinking, you're not. Um, and, and that's one of the subtle things. It, it took me a long time. It, it's as much of a developer I've, as I've turned into a, a couch potato developer. Um, I, I have a background in in martial arts in my youth, and it was one of the things that you you learn to understand that it wasn't about. Um, the person. It was about the the actual interaction itself. You're respecting that you're in this ring. You're expecting you're in the dojo or the dojang uh, for taekwondo, um, and and you okay. and you use these formal things so that way you don't accidentally really get into a fight and really. I'm hurt sorry. Each other. I'm gonna just no worries. Uh, so I I just I just thought the um the. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, because you know why? I mean, that it, like I, I haven't done a whole bunch of martial arts. I did do uh, fencing and like a, a smidgen of taekwondo when I was little, right? Um, but uh, I remember, you know, the like the salute before the the sword yeah. fighting, and you know, part of it was because you wanted it to be over once you got out of the ring, mm-hmm. right? You, you and you didn't want it to be like some big thing, and I I also. I don't know. I I talked about it in the blog post that I got it from. Uh, I went to this uh, school for a year, which is where I also did the fencing, uh, and it was actually a convention there that in classes, you know, you would. I mean, you would literally have uh, 
you know, religious people and atheists discussing the Bible in this school, right? right? And there was a, a class of, uh, you know, it was about reading great books, and one of the great books is the freaking Bible. Mm -hmm. And this is like a, a really, you know, people, it, it, it can be a very personal <laughs> thing, yeah, yeah. And in order, like, how do you create an atmosphere where people who disagree about such an incredible fundamental thing can still learn from each other, right? And and one of those things is like let's let's show a baseline level of respect mm -hmm. to uh, you know I I don't know if it's gonna catch on right I don't know if I'm gonna be able to say like a, you know two years from now everybody is calling each other you know Mister this and Ms that and you know you're gonna bring bring you're bringing back the Victorian <sighs> era is what you're yeah doing. yeah like I don't know if We're that's really gonna happen and hoop skirts and, <laughs> and monocles of course yeah. right like that would be you know, um, kind of a strange accomplishment. I'm not sure if it would be a good thing, you know? But, like, yeah, and, and I'm not going to stop swearing, right? Because I swear all over the place. I'm kind of surprised I made it this far without, you know, without, without saying anything like that. But, uh, you know, frankly, like, I even worry that it might be a situation where, you know, people who aren't writing Ruby or who write Ruby but also write other languages might be like, what's going on with these people that they can't even talk to each other anymore and they gotta like, you know, I must put on my suit and refer to you as Mr. This and, <laughs> you know, like, it, it seems a little crazy. Well, I, yeah? I, I think the Ruby developers have always been kind of the weirdos. Uh, that's, <laughs> always doing... Yeah, uh, yeah, fair enough. Dramatic. If it, it's gonna be anything, it's gonna be dramatic. But, uh, yeah, well, I mean, and it is, it is a little bit of drama, right? It's like uh, a little ritual uh, you know, as opposed to just saying, hey, dude, you know. But, like, that it seems to me is, like, one of the most acceptable um, weirdnesses, one of the most, um, you know, non-destructive eccentricities you could possibly cultivate, right? It's like, I am, you know, too nice to people, right? That would be a great problem to have. Yeah. But, and it, it is one of the things that I, I also didn't start off in a Ruby... Uh, world, I came from uh, .NET development, which was very, very corporate, very, very um, formal, uh, but in a different way. Um, can I can I just interrupt sure. one? I, I know I talk a lot, but no worries. one thing I absolutely hate about corporate environments, fucking cannot stand, is when people like you know, I'm going to use my corporate position to tell you what to do, and I'm going to call you by your first name. But there's also this little atmosphere that if I'm like you know. Mr. VP, right, or whatever, or CEO guy, you can't call me by my first name, right? right? And it's a power play. Yeah, it, it is, and it's like this business casual thing, because technically you do know the CEO's first name, right? Yes. It's just like you can't use it for some <laughs> secret reason, Yeah. you know? And I, I just feel like if you're going to be in a situation where, you know, I mean, basically, in Rails' is own McCann, say, you know, Mr. Heinemeyer Hansen pulled rank, right? He just said, it's my project, I'm going to do what I want. And the thing is, I can totally respect that. I could totally see myself making the same decision if it was my project, you know? And, you know, frankly, like, the guy transformed my career, right? Transformed my experience as a developer, raised my standards forever as to what developing could be. You know, if he wants yeah. to say it's, it's my project, you know, tough okay you know but if you're if you're gonna pull rank then maybe you know I mean mister was at some point probably a type of rank right there was like sir lord mister you know uh, if you're a butler <laughs> yeah. you refer to you know it, like uh, okay this is a massive tangent but watching <laughs> Batman movies, whenever there's a Batman story where Bruce Wayne is a kid, mm -hmm. it makes me very, very angry because they always have Alfred referring to Bruce Wayne as, you know, Mr. Bruce, right? Or Master Wayne. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, they don't do that, but they should. Like, if you're a butler and you're speaking to your, like, you know, Lord's child, mm -hmm. you refer to it as uh, it. You refer to them as Master, mm -hmm. right? Even though they're a kid. When they grow up, they become Mister. This is a very strange thing, you know. It's a yeah. relic of the Victorian era. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's I, total tangent. I, I don't think that Master you could means. Even edit that out. I don't, I don't no, 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 no. We're gonna keep it. Just, 
no, Batman we... movies and their historical <laughs> inaccuracy. <laughs> I don't know. The, that guy running around with a cape and the flying bat wing. It's so inaccurate. Right, right. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I accept the cape and, yeah. and the, like, you know, the spaceship that he just drives around New York in. Yeah. But, you know, mis misusing Victorian <laughs> era titles, you know, in their subtle differences. Ooh. I'm sure even in the Victorian era, there was there was always some little subtlety that that would get somebody hung up on something. Literally hung up, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, so, just you know, kind of coming uh, to a wrap, I want to actually go backwards in history a little bit. And, and you've you've been involved in uh, open source software, it, so you you have a perspective. So when you're writing this blog post, you're not just coming out of the blue and saying, "Oh, I'm somebody who's been outside of this community and." This is just what I see uh, is going on here. I mean, you've been doing Ruby development since before Rails, right? Uh, no, not quite. I mean, okay. when you talk about, like, I wanted to interrupt earlier, but I, I didn't, because um, you said, like, doing Ruby development since the beginning. And if you look at someone like, I don't know, uh, Opti Grimm or Jim Wyrick, right, they really were around before Rails. Mm -hmm. uh, me, I, I was brought to Ruby by Rails Technically, in 2005, oh. but we're talking like December 28th, 2005. So really, 2006. But it was like a zero dot something still around that. Yeah, time. it was it was Rails zero dot one three, um, and I did spend a bunch of time just you know on you know Ruby uh, for its own sake mm -hmm. um, because you know it, it's neat. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. you know with uh, and uh, just speaking about languages. You were uh, speaking about Archaeopteryx. Am I even close? Um, no, that's absolutely it, completely correct. Okay, great. And the uh, that that's written in all JavaScript, correct? No, I've ported it to JavaScript. It was written in Ruby. I did some tricks to make it act a little like JavaScript, though. Uh, I used Lambda all over the place, and I aliased L to Lambda. So, because you can do that with JavaScript, you can just put a function anywhere, mm -hmm. and I, I wanted to do that. I didn't even realize it was like JavaScript esque at the time that I was doing it, but then I ported it, uh, most of it, not all of it, mm -hmm. to to CoffeeScript, and I renamed it Clyde because uh, oh, okay. it's just one syllable. Clyde it's Stubblefield. Clyde Stubblefield. Yeah. Yes, yes, the funky drummer. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I think that's where I was uh, trying to tie it into. I was, I was, I. I I had brought this in the last second before we, we started the interview. Um, was okay. uh, the was that you had talked about Archaeopteryx and, and Clyde, and I was just wondering: Are you one of those people that is post Ruby, or are you still doing Ruby? Oh no! Um, like last year, I did a ton of Ruby. All this year, like I have, I've been, I'm still hacking some projects of my own. Um, but you know, all this year is an entire month. Uh, right now, all I'm doing is uh, writing and creating like videos and stuff like that. Um, but you know, using Ruby and you know, there's some Node.js in there. But like the Node.js music stuff is really more of a side project. Uh, like is that a beat been... a day. Sorry. Are you doing a beat a day thing? A beat a day. Like, you, are you creating? Because I noticed on your site you had uh -huh. uh, today's beats. Oh. Uh, no, so, like, I, I also have another thing called DJ Goat Boy, which is a Twitter account. Uh, and initially, I started that, like, 2009, I think, and the goal was to make a new beat every single day. Right. And I, I got the idea for that uh, from Courtney Gaskin from ENTP. Um, and it was, it was a really good idea, and it made me much better at making music. Uh, but the majority of those are just made, you know, like, I have, like, a synthesizer and actually four... <laughs> You know, or or three point five or whatever. Actually, I don't I don't know how many synthesizers I have because where's my iPad? I got like like four on here. Oh, yeah, on your, but, on your iPad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can buy like the iPad's amazing. You can get a synthesizer for like five dollars. <laughs> uh, but for but, virtualization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some of them are really amazing. But um, epic tangent. Point is, like, some of them I create like in the you know, in the normal way that a person would create music, and then some of them I create with code. And I recently just got uh, Clyde uh, able to do bass lines as well as drums. And I, I don't use it as much as I use the, the typical tools, but 
I think once it's a little uh, honed, because I kind of put it aside for a while. I was doing all kinds of other things for a while. Um, but I think it's actually really going to be useful because I was finding that the music that I was making was more exciting to listen to. Uh, because when you, you know, you know how when you write code and you are actually really understanding every little bit, because sometimes you write code and you're like, uh, ah, it worked, you know, and other times you know exactly what it's doing and it does exactly what you expect and you, you know, you have it under test and you're very familiar with every little last piece. Right. There is a, a wonderful feeling, a clarity that you get in that situation. And I was having a little bit of that making music with code, whereas the normal way of me making music, um, it either involves like actually just playing an instrument, in which case you do have a, that same feeling, mm -hmm. or um, using like a GUI, right? Like Ableton Live or uh, Logic Pro, there are various programs. And using those programs, uh, you know, you're working through a GUI and the GUI kind of introduces like a layer of distance, right? Because mm -hmm. you've got, you know, uh, I know what I want the computer to do and now I have to find out what metaphor that the user experience designers chose mm -hmm. for that. Uh, and it's really nice to, you know, just go straight to the code and just be like, I want you to play this note at this moment. I want it to have this velocity. Uh, and, you know, in upcoming episodes, there's going to be more stuff, blah, blah, blah. But uh, it's very satisfying. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, sit down and chat. It's been really uh, interesting. Thanks. Very, very glad to be here. Thank. I, I enjoyed it. <laughs>